What is going hey. on? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Worldwide uh, Neural Developmental Series. Um, my name is Stephanie Bolak, and I'm very happy to introduce today our two speakers, uh, Richard Smith, who will give a flash talk in the first part, followed by the seminar of Fiona Francis. So as you may know, uh, there's this new feature in the Worldwide Neural Developmental Series where we encourage PhD and postdocs to present their data in a one slide, three minute presentation. So please apply for this. Richard is gone. Okay. Um, I hope it's okay. Richard, can you hear us? Okay. Um, well, I guess he's reconnecting. Um, so Richard Smith is a young investigator in the lab of Chris Walsh at Harvard Medical School. And his research aims to understand the diverse uh, mechanisms that contribute to formation of neuronal circuits and their defects in cortical malformations and um, neuropsychiatric disease. Um, I'm trying to reconnect him. And his work supports a role of ion channel dysfunction in prenatal human uh, brain disorder. Uh, Richard, are you okay? Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, so I guess he's having a little uh, problem. Um, so he's working on developmental channelopathies. Um, and Richard has recently published um, a very nice review that, that I recommend that it's published in um, Trends of Neuroscience. Richard, are you okay? Um, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. I'm still, when I click screen share, I'm still getting a little issue. So I don't know if I need. If you want to share your screen, now you, can, you can go ahead. Sorry, I apologize. This is maybe. Would it be possible to um, start with Fiona? Yeah, and then I'll come back. Okay, so we have. Yeah, uh, I apologize. This is okay. No problem. So uh, I'm very happy to to host the seminar of Fiona Francis today. Uh, Fiona is the director of the Ferra Moulin Institute in Paris. This is a they're a nice institute devoted to the study of neurodevelopment and plasticity of the nervous system. She's also a group leader who is uh, co-head with uh, Laurence Coutebrosse and a team working on cortical development and pathology. Um, so she was trained in the UK at Bath University and University College London studying biochemistry, molecular genetics and genomics. And she has worked in many labs in the US, Australia, Germany, and now she's been in France for uh, many years. So Fiona has received uh, many uh, prizes and fellowships, among them um, EMBO in Saint-Marny, Betancourt Schuller Foundation, FRC Rotary. She has made a very important contribution to the understanding of molecular and cellular mechanisms leading to neuronal migration disorders, in particular heterotopia. And she has specific interest in microtubule associated proteins, such as the cortin and the EML1, but also the addition protein Casper2. Uh, she uses several mass mutants uh, to study their role in neurodevelopment. So uh, Fiona is not only an excellent scientist, she's also an incredibly kind person. And so I now invite you to enjoy your tea while listening to her talk. Uh, you can write your questions in the um, uh, question box. You can also send uh, friendly messages in the chat window. Um, à tout à l'heure. You can share your screen, Fiona. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. To have this possibility of sharing my work. Um, thank you to Stephanie and also to Denis for this opportunity. So as you can see from my title slide, I'm going to be talking about project I'm going to be talking about neocortical development and concerning the cortical malformations well these are actually illustrated here on my first slide so I'm going to be talking actually about the lysencephaly spectrum so the lysencephaly spectrum these are classically known as neuronal migration disorders but as you can see I'm going to be talking about progenitor mechanisms so this is what I'd like to discuss with you today
talking more about neocortical development um, and some of the cell types which interest me, this is shown perhaps more clearly on this slide. So this schema is um, taken from a review written by Delfina Romero uh, concerning um, the different cell types and the different zones of the developing cortical wall. So this is a schema taken um, or supposed to represent a human neocortical development. As you can see from the schema, there are different cell types represented. And so first of all, you have these purple cells here, which are known as radial glial cells, which many of you will be aware of. So these radial glial cells, they tend to have long basal processes which would extend up to the peel surface, um, as well as shorter apical processes, which descend down to the boundary with the cerebral ventricles shown here. These um, cells will go through the cell cycle, moving their nucleus in order to divide at the ventricular boundary. There are also other progenitors which are produced from the radial glial cells, and these are intermediate progenitors shown here in green, as well as these basal or outer radial glial cells shown here in orange. These cells are highly abundant in the primate brain, whereas they're almost absent from the rodent brain. So this is a difference um, occurring during evolution. The basal radial glial cells, these are also derived from the radial glial cells, the apical radial glial cells in the ventricular zone, and they express many markers uh, in common. So the immature neurons, these can be produced from each of these different progenitor um, cell types, and they will migrate in this radial orientation using the basal processes of the radial shown up here in blue, where cells will settle the neurons, and they will then continue to grow axons and dendrites, and of course make connections with other cells. So uh, this is uh, how it all occurs. And in fact, there are waves of migrating neurons which are generated during development. And that's indicated on this schema. Here you have the radial glial cells represented here. And these will actually have different transcriptional identities during corticogenesis. They're going to produce the other progenitor types and also the immature neurons. And these immature neurons, they're going to have different characteristics with the earliest born neurons settling in the deeper layers of the cortex, with the later born neurons settling in the more and more superficial layers in order to give this, this laminar pattern of the cortex, which is in fact the pattern that we know in the adult cortex as well, with these cells being organized in cortical columns and making connections between them. So cortical lamination is actually absolutely critical for the function of the brain. And you can have certain disorders, uh, for instance, in this Lys encephaly spectrum, represented here on this slide, where we see that not only do you lose cortical folds on the surface of the brain in the severest uh, version of these disorders, but you also have abnormal lamination represented here with this big grey band, which is extending into the white matter. So this is um, agyria or lysencephaly. You can also have pachygyria, which similarly has abnormal cortical lamination. And in this case, there is simplified gyri on the surface of the brain. And this is also still a very, very severe neurological disorder. In this other version, double cortex, also known as subcortical band heterotopia, represented on this MRI, here, in fact, you have these neuronal soma, which are found within the white matter. And so, as well as having a relatively normal cortex, shown here on, in the superficial regions of the brain, you also have neuronal soma, which look to be arrested in the migration. We know that the, uh, the migration occurs from the ventricles during development, so from this region of the brain, deep in the brain, with neurons which will migrate up to these superficial regions. So when you have subcortical band heterotopia, it's as though neuronal soma are found in the region which was the migration zone during development. So this is why these disorders are known as neuronal migration disorders. Human genetics experiments, um, human genetics in fact, from 
on patient DNAs, and especially in some cases, families uh, exhibiting different versions of these pathologies, have revealed um, a number of different genes, of which many listed here um, play a role um, in, with re respect to the microtubule cytoskeleton. So the LIS1 gene was one of the first genes to be identified. This was identified by Orly Reiner in 1993. And LIS1 codes for a protein which will regulate dynein, which is a, a microtubule motor, which will move along microtubules carrying different cargoes. DCX or double cortin, this was um, is also one of the major genes for this spectrum of disorders. And double cortin codes for a microtubule associated protein. Microtubule associated proteins can both nucleate and stabilize microtubules. And so double cortin plays an important role in these processes. As you can see as well, there are a number of other genes which have been identified in similar cortical malformations, which code for proteins playing a role at the microtubule cytoskeleton. So we've been able to learn more about the functions of these proteins from different in vitro and structural uh, experiments. And as well as that, we've been able to look at migrating neurons, which express certain mutations, in this case, a mutation mutation in alpha-1 tubulin, and being able to study the morphology and the speed of migration of these neurons during development. And we've been able to show that in some cases there is slowed migration, and in this case as well, there is an abnormal behavior of the centrosome. So this has um, been important in order to identify some of the roles of these proteins, potentially playing a role during neuronal migration. On the other hand, and as shown on this slide, when uh, certain animal models were generated for some of these uh, LIS encephaly genes in human, some of the surprises were that the neocortex seemed to be very similar to wild type, in fact, in the mutant brain. So this is shown here uh, for the double cortin knockout. And this was um, a knockout which was initially produced in Chris Walsh's lab. And so in the double cortin knockout, you can see here uh, that the neocortex looks relatively normal and in fact looks very similar to wild type. So this, of course, was quite disappointing. The fact that double cortin would give very severe um, perturbation of the neocortex in human brain, whereas in the rodent brain, uh, there seemed to be no obvious abnormalities. The only abnormalities which were obvious in this and some other similar uh, mass mutants shown here is that the hippocampus, which is a course part of the cortex, the hippocampus shows the pyramidal cell layer showing um, it being present in two different layers, either in the CA3 region of the hippocampus or the CA1 region and the CA3 region, as well as in some cases the dentate gyrus. So these seem to be radial migration abnormalities occurring in these mouse mutants, however, restricted only to the hippocampus. This was, of course, somewhat perplexing in these congenital mouse models. Uh, why was it that the neocortex itself was not affected? And this led at the time to multiple discussions on whether, in fact, it might be compensation. For instance, when you have a knockout, for instance, uh, like a knockout of the double cortin gene, where um, this is occurring from very early stages, um, so it's a congenital mutation, maybe in this case, some other proteins which could play the role of double cortin might be increased in their activity in order to compensate for the double cortin protein. It was also discussed at the time that maybe this was due to major differences between the rodent and the primate cortices. On the other hand, we know that the Rela mass mutant showing mutations in the Relin gene, this does show very severe cortical lamination abnormalities, suggesting that neuronal migration processes are actually um, totally conserved between rodent and primate brains. So this was all intriguing. And we were actually very happy to begin to learn about a different set of mutants here in the rat and also in the mouse. So this is mutants where there appeared to be something resembling a heterotopic band, like the subcortical band heterotopia uh, seen previously in patients. So we were interested in trying to identify how um, a heterotopic band could arise 
in this set of rodent mutants, whereas the lysencephaly gene mutations didn't give anything like this. So we were lucky to be able to work with Alexandra Crocloir, who identified, in fact, this heterotopic cortex or uh, HECO mouse strain, um, working together with Michelle Keelar, who had performed some of the initial characterization of this mouse model. So Alexandra contacted me because he knew that I was interested in the genetics of these cortical malformations to ask whether I would be interested in working with him for this particular mouse model. So we were very happy to be able to um, continue to work with this echo mass model and to study this heterotopic band to try and understand why you could have this situation in this particular mass mutant. So this mass mutant arose spontaneously. Alexandre Crocloir was able to identify it and he was able in his animal house to establish a line of mutants um, expressing this uh, band heterotopia. He was able to identify that this was an autosomal recessive condition and then we were able to work with him to perform genetics in the mouse in order to try and identify the mutant gene. So the mutant gene actually turned out to be yet another microtubule binding protein, in this case EMR1 for echinoderm microtubule associated protein like. So EMR1 had never been studied in brain development. Its role in neurons was actually really unknown. And so working together with Francoise, Francoise Thuy and Sara Visotto, who were able to identify this gene, we then began to um, study it further and to, to learn more about it. Of course, one of the first experiments to perform was to try and identify whether we could uh, um, uh, find any further uh, mutations in EML1, in this case related to human patients. So we were able to initially find two families which exhibited this phenotype shown here on this MRI. So these, um, these patients were exhibiting very severe heterotopia. So this is an atypical form of heterotopia, which is very rare, in fact. It's known as ribbon heterotopia. And you can see that it fills the white matter in the frontal regions of the brain, extending from the ventricles, in fact, to have this globular and even um, gyrated mass of neuronal soma found uh, within the white matter. So this is a very severe um, disorder associated also with macrocephaly and polymicrogyria when there are multiple small um, gyri on the surface of the brain. So we now know of six families around the world uh, which uh, have uh, mutations in EML1 and show this very, very similar phenotype with this severe version of heterotopia. So with severe heterotopia in the mouse and severe heterotopia in human, we wanted to know more about the mechanisms whereby you could have this heterotopia in the mouse model. So one of the first experiments to look at was migrating neurons. And in fact, um, as you can see here written uh, very clearly, one of the surprises was that by uh, analyzing migrating neurons labeled with green fluorescent protein, which was electroporated into these radial glial cells shown here in blue, um, and then analyzing these cells in the upper intermediate zone, we could identify no differences in the migrating neurons. They could migrate at the same speed. They had similar morphologies to wild type. And there was only the, the situation that a number of these cells uh, were reduced in number, in fact, in these regions of the upper intermediate zone. As you can see here, though, what really explained this phenotype in this mass mutant were abnormal progenitor cells. So as you can see represented in blue here, then um, I have these radial glial cells and you can see that the radial glial cells, some of them have left the ventricular zone and are now found in the intermediate zone. This was initially shown by performing BRDU um, labelings and also with KI67, a marker of proliferating cells. And you can see with just 30 minutes after uh, the BRDU had been injected into the pregnant mouse, you can see that there's actually a dispersion of these proliferating cells throughout the cortical wall instead of being restricted to the ventricular zones as shown here in the wild type. As well, using a marker of radial glials, in this case, 
PAC-6, labeling radioglial cells, which are normally in the wild type, really restricted to the ventricular zone, we could see in the mouse mutant that there were many PAC-6 positive nuclei, and therefore the soma of these radioglial cells found in this uh, intermediate zone and also in the cortical plate. And so these, um, uh, these uh, PAC6 positive cells were um, dispersed throughout the intermediate zone. Sorry, I'm just going to... And so um, basically we could see um, that these PAC6 positive cells were normally present uh, in this region, which was related to um, a region where you might expect to have basal radioglial cells um, during um, development of the human brain. Whereas here in the rodent cortex, you would not necessarily expect there to be multiple numbers of these neurons, of these um, progenitor cells. So how did these arise? Well, first of all, we were um, interested in the radioglial cell processes, and we were able to show, in fact, that radioglial cell processes, they are existing um, uh, in, the, in these mouse mutants, but in a very disorganized fashion. And so there are numbers of these cells uh, which um, uh, are present within the intermediate zone, and these cells um, uh, will therefore um, reduce the number of radioglial cell processes in the, um, in the intermediate zone so that when neurons are generated, they are less able to migrate up to the cortical plate. So in red, green and blue, you can see progenitor cells. And you can see as well in our model, we've uh, uh, called these misplaced progenitors when many of these cells are actually present in the intermediate zone. And I'm not showing you the data for this today, but we were able to show that um, these cells are going through mitosis. And so they are a local source of neurons within the intermediate zone. And therefore, when the neurons are produced and they're perhaps unable to find a radioglial cell process, then they are um, probably going to get blocked in the intermediate zone and there'll be an accumulation of these neurons over time so that you have the development of a heterotopic band. We don't yet know, in fact, exactly how the heterotopic band generates, and this is something that we want to look more uh, into in the future. But in fact, with our work and what I'm going to present to you today, we were interested in why some of the radioglial cells leave the ventricular zone. Why are they able to detach from the other progenitor cells in the ventricular zone to move their soma up into the intermediate zone, in, but carrying on going through mitosis in this region. So we were interested in the ventricular zone and in cells going through um, these processes at the ventricular boundary. Of course, this is now a big question um, in the field, knowing that basal radioglial cells are highly abundant in primate brains whereas they're almost absent from rodent brains. So people are interested in these mechanisms as to how an apical radioglial cell can give rise to basal radioglial cells at the appropriate time during the development of a primate brain. Some of the, the um, processes which have been identified in the generation of basal radioglial cells are the changing of spindle orientations on the one hand, which um, can affect um, some, some daughter cells being able to detach from the other progenitor cells in the ventricular zone. And as well as that, some of the other mechanisms concern the adhesion molecules, because radioglial cells, they're joined together very tightly via adherence uh, junctions, and if you change these adhesion molecules, this can also cause some of the cells to leave the ventricular zone and in some cases become basal radioglial cells. So we were interested in these mechanisms and especially we've been interested in these mechanisms occurring during these pathological situations of having cortical malformations. So taking advantage of the EMR1 loss of function mutation, we decided that we could perhaps learn more about some of these mechanisms, at least occurring in this pathological situation. So one of the first um, sets of data that I'm going to describe to you is um, talking about what happens in these mouse mutants, what are the mechanisms which give rise to this radioglial cell detachment. 
we can study this in our mouse mutant, but of course we also want to study this in um, different models and especially um, in other human in vitro models in order to uh, try and learn more about um, how uh, this can all happen, not only in the mouse, but also in, in human situations. So first of all, we would need to know what is the role of EMR1, um, what is the role in uh, these radial glial cells. And because EMR1, I mentioned to you, it's a microtubule binding protein, we would want to know as well, during these different stages of the cell cycle of these radial glial cells, where EMR1 might be playing a role. And so in blue is represented the microtubules. We know that microtubules, of course, are very critical during mitosis, but microtubules are also critical um, during uh, the stage is the other stages of the cell cycle, well, this moving its nucleus up and down within the ventricular zone. There's also this apical process, which I mentioned earlier on, and this has a centrosome or microtubule organizing center in the apical end foot with a primary uh, cilia, which is inserting into the ventricles and receiving signals telling the cells um, to perform different stages of the cell cycle. So we decided to analyze these different um, these different uh, stages of the cell cycle, starting with these dividing cells. So here I was talking about spindle orientations earlier on. So when you have um, a certain spindle orientation in this mode, this is when there's a vertical cleavage plane. And this would be a symmetrical division when you have one, um, one cell which divides to give two identical daughter cells. So this can happen at certain stages of corticogenesis, and this is useful for self-renewal of these radial glial cells. You can also, though, have these oblique cleavage planes and in this case there is the possibility that the two daughter cells would not be identical so this would be asymmetric division and one of the cells can have a different fate from a radial glial cell so we first of all studied this in the HECO mass mutant and we were able to show in fact that there was an increase in the number of these oblique divisions and so this is the, the 30 to 60 degree um, angle and so this, of course, could be a reason why we have some cells which can leave the ventricular zone if one of these daughter cells is a Pax6 positive cell and retains its, its uh, capacity to be a radial glial cell. Sarah Bazzotto, she was also interested in going further, looking at these mitotic cells. And she, uh, first of all, looked at the spindle microtubules. However, she couldn't see any differences between the spindle microtubules in the mutant compared to wild type cells. As you can see here though, she used gamma tubulin to label both the spindle poles in these mitotic cells and also um, labeling the centrosomes which are present in the apical end feet. Looking at the distances between the spindle poles, she was able to show in fact, and this was an unexpected result, that in the mouse mutant, there was, the spindles were always longer in the mutant cells. This was irrespective of the spindle orientation in fact, the spindle lengths in these cells just always seemed to be longer. So this was intriguing and Sarah decided to follow this up by then looking at the size of the cells um, or the form of the cells. So first of all, she performed this on fast imaging technique where looking at the, you can look at the whole of the ventricular surface by placing this on the microscope slide. She labelled with n cadherin in order to see the outer um, parts of the cells and also then she labelled the DNA in order to be able to identify the, the cells in, in metaphase. She then looked at the surface area of these cells and um, of course because the spindles were bigger it was not perhaps too surprising that the surface area of these cells was also larger. She then decided to look at the volume of the soma of these cells, aided by Anna Uschiano and collaborators here in Paris. And as you can see here, there was actually no change in the volume of the soma. So it wasn't necessarily that the overall cells were bigger, it was just that they had a larger area. She then also looked at the height of the cells. And as you can see here, the height is reduced. 
And so this suggests then that these cells are actually a different shape from the wild type cells. So this is schematized here. These are the wild type cells in metaphase shown here in red. And this is at the uh, ventricular boundary. And if we compare to the mutant cells, these appear to be flatter. They have longer spindles and they're a different shape. So if they're um, they're flatter, this could then suggest um, two things. So the cells could be flatter and therefore bigger in this um, orientation, which could then cause some other cells to leave because there's not enough space in the ventricular zone. Or, or it, it could be because some cells have actually left the ventricular zone that these cells have um, a larger area to spread out in. In fact, we think that it could be um, a situation more related to abnormal signaling pathways, which are um, apparently uh, the situation in these mutant cells. And so abnormal signaling for some pathways, this has been shown to change shell, uh, cell shape. Julien Ferrand in the lab is now pursuing this further in order to find out more about these abnormal signaling, which could give rise to abnormal shape of these cells. We wanted though also to look at the other stages of the cell cycle and especially these cells when they don't have their soma actually at the ventricular surface. Instead, they have an apical process, which as I mentioned earlier, has a centrosome in the end foot as well as a primary cilia. So we decided to look at um, these, these, the ventricular surface and especially where these apical end feet are. We could see that using F-actin labeling, if we compare the wild type ventricular surface to the mutant ventricular surface, at the level of the F-actin labeling, everything seemed relatively similar. This is in coronal sections. If, however, we used ONFAS imaging, and that's shown here, we could see that generally the mutant um, ventricular surface seems to be quite disorganized, and this is with the same F-actin labeling. So this would not necessarily have been suspected just by looking at these coronal sections. So then looking um, further into the um, the whole of this ventricular surface then, and focusing on apical end feet. This was pursued by Anna Uzkiano when she was performing her PhD thesis in the lab. And what she did was label um, this tissue with gamma tubulin to label the centrosomes and R13b to label the primary cilia, which you can see here in these wild type sections. So she was able to quantify the number of these apical elements, which would have um, both uh, centrosomes and primary cilia. The quantification is shown 15.5. She could see that there were less apical elements with centrosomes and also less primary cilia um, as well in these regions. So this, of course, could once again suggest that some of the cells have left the ventricular zone, and so therefore we see less apical end feet. But during these studies, both using ONFAS imaging and also in coronal sections, Anna had the impression that the primary cilia in the mutants were really not as in wild type. So we decided to perform electron microscopy in order to study further the primary cilia, and this is indicated here. So whereas the primary cilia in these apical end feet of the radial glial cells in the wild type um, brain section, they, the primary cilia are nicely entering into the ventricular fluid. And there's a very nice set, um, duplicated centriole uh, in this region. So this is essentially a small microtubule structure related to either centrosomes or basal bodies, the basal body being uh, what is uh, present at the base of the primary cilia. This was actually absent in the EML1 mutant conditions. So we could see when there were primary cilia that these were greatly reduced in length, but often as well on these apical end feet, there were no primary cilia. And as well, we couldn't see anything very clearly representing the centrioles. This result was also found in patient fibroblasts showing mutations in the EML1 um, protein. So we decided to, to look further into how these primary cilia become inserted into the apical membrane um, in these radial glial cells. So as you can see here, some of the electron microscopy data showed this large ciliary vesicle, which was present around the developing primary cilium.
And in fact, it's known that you have ciliary proteins which are derived from the Golgi apparatus, and these then get trafficked uh, towards the apical membrane with these uh, vesicles associating with the centrioles, and there being further vesicles added over time. And then and with the growth of, of a primary cilium, this will distort the large ciliary vesicle to have this situation here before you have insertion of the primary cilia into the apical membrane. Looking into the mutant tissue, we were able to see that there were more often cilia present within these vesicles within the tissue and this could explain perhaps why we didn't have many primary cilia at the apical membrane and as well as that these primary cilia were not always oriented in the same direction sometimes they were pointing basally instead of apically as well as this so as mentioned previously there were always these abnormal centriolar situation even within the tissue so Donya Zaidi in the lab is continuing to study the abnormal centrioles and these trafficking processes of all these proteins in order to reach the apical membrane. So we hope to learn more about that in the future. On the other hand, we wanted to still uh, try and establish that EML1 may play a role at the primary cilia. And so for this, uh, we were able to perform a spectrometry screen in order of EML1 from embryonic day 13.5 mouse cortical extracts. We identified a list of proteins and of course a number of these were related to the Golgi apparatus or um, primary cilia or transport and different processes as well. But one of these proteins was RPGRIT1L which is known to play a role at the base of the primary cilia. So we performed biochemistry experiments in order to confirm that there was an interaction between EML1 and RPGRIT1L. So as you can see here from this immunoprecipitation experiment, where we've co-transfected a flag EML1 construct with a CMIC RPGRIT1L construct, and then we've used antibodies to uh, capture and the, the, the flag tag and the associated protein complex. As you can see here, in the presence of EML1, when we immunoprecipitate EML1 in this way, we co-immunoprecipitate RPGRIT1L, and this is not the case when EML1 is not present. So it seems that EML1 can interact with RPGRIT1L, and maybe this can help explain how EML1 plays a role in ciliogenesis. Importantly as well, by exome sequencing, we were able to identify these very particular mutations in RPGRIT1L in this patient who has a very severe form of um, atypical heterotopia resembling the EML1 situation. So we know when we mutate RPGRIT1L, this mu mutations will actually affect the binding with EML1. And when you have mutations in EML1, this also affects the binding. So it seems that these two proteins must be working together and must be related to uh, abnormalities in primary cilia, displacing radial glial cell progenitors and leading to heterotopia. So this is what we've been able to identify by our work in the mouse. And as I also, um, and also uh, by identifying mutations in human patients. But as I mentioned to you previously, we also wanted to try and identify what might be the situation if you have mutations of EML1 and here in these human in vitro models. So for this, we carried out a collaboration with Julia Ladewig's lab in Germany, working with Anna Jabili, who was able to generate organoids from EML1 patients and compare them to control organoids. So here you can see a control organoid, which has been in culture for 35 days. You can see that there's a large ventricular zone at this stage, and also you can see something resembling a cortical plate above it. If we compare now to EML1 mutation organoids, here you can see the um, progenitor zone as in the, in the wild type, but as well as this, you can see what appears to be a second progenitor zone, which is above this, and there are neurons which are produced um, in and around the second layer of progenitor cells in these organoid cultures. So this seems to be a situation perhaps quite similar to, to what we have seen in the mouse model. Yulia's group were able to 
continue the, these organoids and they've performed a variety of experiments of which I only show you some immunohistochemistry here. So using N-cadherin, which is generally a marker which is strongly expressed at the ventricular boundary, as well as being there in the organoid cultures, there were also these rosette style um, uh, structures appearing in the second ventricular zone, uh, appearing above this, um, sorry, the second progenitor zone, appearing above this ventricular zone. There were also as well, um, um, so in an, a knockout of EML1, which Amar uh, Jabali performed using genome editing, he could see this situation appearing perhaps even more strongly with these rosettes occurring in this disorganized progenitor zone. He also used R13b to label the primary cilia, and this is shown here. You can see R13b once again at the ventricular boundary on the radial glial cells, the ventricular radial glial cells. But as well as that, there's a lot of R13b labeling, which is occurring in the second progenitor zone, um, and this occurs as well um, in the patient uh, mutation as well as the knockout version. And performing different cultures, so 2D cultures, they were also able to measure the lengths of primary cilia in uh, these different cultures, finding that when you have EML1 mutations, this will reduce the length of the primary cilia. So here, even with these um, human in vitro studies, they seem to closely resemble what we see in the mouse. And maybe then we can make this association between abnormal primary cilia, abnormal progenitors, and heterotopia situations. So this is what we, we expect to be a big problem in these uh, related to mutations in EMR1, seeing problems at the, the centrosomes and the primary cilia in these radial glial cells. So EMR1 and RPGRIP1L, when you have mutations in these genes, then you will have some radial glial cells which are able to detach and then move out of the ventricular zone. We know as well from other studies uh, by um, studying other centrosomal proteins such as acne. This can also affect both the cytoskeleton and the adherence junctions between these radial glial cells, and this can perturb either the position of the centrosome or the remodeling of the um, adherence junction arise, um, having cells which leave the ventricular zone. We know as well with these different adhesion molecules, one of which we studied in the lab, so DLGAP4 studied by Delfino Romero, um, DLGAP4 actually also shows mutations in the heterotopia patient. This is related to uh, connections between the actin cytoskeleton and adherence junctions. And once again, when you mutate this gene in the mouse, it will cause progenitors to leave the ventricular zone. So by each of these mechanisms, this suggests that in these apical end feet of these radial glial cells, the cytoskeleton, as well as the, uh, the centrosome and the adherence junction seem to be critical for retaining cells in the ventricular zone. We know as well in EMR1 mutant situations that the adherence junctions are not normal in these cells. They're both reduced in length and they also have certain um, little breakages in these adherence junctions. So we don't really know what comes first, abnormalities in signaling which could produce these processes or abnorm abnormalities in the trafficking of the adherence junctions uh, proteins through the apical process from the Golgi apparatus in order to reach the apical end feed. And this is something which we'll continue to study further. So what I've told you about um, up till now is studying radial glial cell detachment from the ventricular zone via the study of these heterotopia models. And what I wanted to also tell you about today is a different approach that we took in the lab where we were interested in using other mouse models which don't show anything resembling these basal radial glial cells, but instead um, um, we would use a process to try and generate basal radial glial cells in, e in, in order to try and study what might go wrong with this particular cell type in the models, um, or at least um, where we might be able to predict that basal radial glial cells in human might also be showing some problems in the cortical malformations. 
So this was um, experiments which were carried out by Maxime Pennesson, um, guided by Richard Belvindra in the lab. And we decided to focus on the lysencephaly gene mouse mutants, which, as I mentioned to you earlier on, don't show a strong neocortical phenotype in the mouse, which is different from the human situation where there's a strong neocortical phenotype. So we decided that it would be interesting to use these genetic methods to try and increase the amount of basal radial glial cells in these mouse mutants to see whether the basal radial glial cells were actually different in the mutant situation. So we decided to use the LIS1 mouse model. LIS1, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the, the first genes identified to show mutations in LIS and Ceph it shows uh, the very severest form of the disorder with the loss of folds on the surface of the brain, the abnormal cortical layers, and in some cases of acrocephaly. So LIS1 mouse mutants were generated some time ago now by Shinji Hirotsuni. He was the first person to, to generate mouse mutants in 1998. What he was able to show is that if you reduce the amounts of LIS1 to less than 50%, so here 35%, then you would have very severe neocortical um, problems. If, on the other hand, you had LIS1 present in this mouse model at 50% in the heterozygote situation, the neocortex looks relatively normal. The heterozygote situation in human gives, though, this very, very severe disorder. So our question was, um, if we could deplete LIS1 in a mouse model like this and then produce basal radial glial-like cells in the mouse, what would they be like? Would they function properly? Could this help explain why in human you have some very severe defects? For uh, the method of producing basal radial glial cells in the mouse, we decided to use TBC1D3. Through character 2016 by Ju and colleagues, and it was shown that it's not expressed in the rodent brain. But if you express it in the rodent brain, you can favorize the production of basal radial glial like cells in the mouse, and this can even give you folds on the surface of the mouse brain. This is one of several genes now which are, are known to be able to perform this. Um, there were several genes identified earlier uh, which um, also showed the same uh, phenotype. Here in this study, they were also able to reduce the amounts of TBC1D3 in human embryonic brain slices and showed that there were many fewer basal radial glial cells produced. So we decided that we could electroporate this in our mass mutant, in our LIS1 mass mutant, and also then see whether we could produce the basal radial glial like cells. So, first of all, this was our experimental procedure. We took uh, the flox allele of LIS1 mice and we crossed these mice with EMX1 Cree, which is expressed from embryonic day 9.5 in the mouse and is a forebrain specific Cree. So, producing, first of all, these different um, genotypes of the knockout, the heterozygote, compared to the wild type. As you can see here, looking at these P0 brains, we can see that the heterozygote brain seems to be very similar to the wild type brain under these conditions. As you can see here, though, the knockout, so the four brain specific knockout using EMX1 Cree, led when we have no uh, LIS1, led to the situation where you more or less do not have a four brain. Um, the heterozygote, on the other hand, we were able to measure the thickness of the cortex and show that it was similar uh, to wild type suggesting that in the heterozygote conditions, the neocortex is produced relatively normally. So we then decided to just produce heterozygotes and to compare them to wild type. And so we, we generated these embryos, which we then used in utero electroporation to express either TBC1D3 or a control vector. And we combined this always with this reporter vector. Uh, were performed at embryonic day 14.5, these electroporations, and we sacrificed the mice at embryonic day 16.5. So we have four conditions that we're analysing, the wild type electroporated with the control vector, the heterozygote electroporated with the control vector, and both of these, wild type and heterozygote, electroporated with TBC1D3. So as you can see here, we first of all uh, wanted to test PAC6 positive uh, radial glial cells, as well as proliferating cells expressing KI67 to see whether we could produce these basal radial glial-like cells.
the quantifications are shown here for these PAC6 positive, KI67 positive, tomato positive cells amongst the electroporated cells. So here, Maxime quantified uh, the, the numbers of these cells in the different zones of the developing cortex. So ventricular zone, subventricular zone, and intermediate zone. And as you can see here, in, so the first two bars, these are representing when you have the control plasmid electroporated into and into heterozygote. And the second two darker bars, this is when you have TBC1D3 electroporated into the wild type versus the hatch bars, TBCD1D3 electroporated into the um, heterozygote. So you can see that we were able to have this increase in these PAC6 positive, KI67 positive electroporated cells in the intermediate zone when we electroporate TBC1D3 in the wild type. However, as you can see here from the hatch bars, we did not have this increase of these basal radioglial-like cells in the uh, LIS1 heterozygote. So this was um, something which we didn't necessarily expect, but it was the result uh, in this LIS1 heterozygote condition. So we wanted to know more about this. So first of all, Maxine performed labelings for phosphohistone 3 in order to look at the mitotic cells. So as you're as I've mentioned previously, uh, the mitotic cells, these are generally in the ventricular zone. They're found really at the boundary with the ventricles. So they're on the ventricular surface. So these mitotic cells uh, are generally present in this region, and we describe them as ventricular. And this is shown by this light gray bar in this control wild type condition. However, as you can see in the three other conditions shown on the graph, instead of having many cells which are ventricular, we had a higher proportion of cells which we described as abventricular, meaning that they were mitotic cells which were not present on the ventricular surface, as though mitosis was not occurring in the correct position. So this was occurring in the, in the heterozygote condition, even just electroporated with the control plasmid, as well as the TBC1D3 conditions. So it seems that all of these conditions will promote these abventricular mitoses. We then decided to look at spindle orientations, as we could expect that maybe spindle orientations would be abnormal, abnormal when you have the expression of TBC1D3, but also in the LIS1 heterozygote conditions. So this has been shown previously when you have The mutations of this wider variability of spindle angles. And in fact, so we identified in our experiments exactly the same situation. You have this variability of the different angles during division. In the wild type situation, electroporated with TBC1D3, here the spindle angles were relatively normal, or at least more similar to the wild type situation electroporated with the control plasmid. On the other hand, in the heterozygote condition electroporated with TBC1D3, once again you have this variability of these angles. This is also shown here, categorized into the, um, the different uh, angles. So as you can see in the control heterozygote condition, this looks different from the control wild type condition. There are, in fact, in the, the oblique angles in, uh, have been, for a certain proportion of them, replaced by a situation where you have a horizontal cleavage angle, a vertical division. So this suggests that you have something quite different going on in the heterozygote uh, mass for this one. In the TBC1D3 situation, it slightly changes to increase the number of oblique divisions So this situation, which, as mentioned previously, this could be associated with the production of basal radioglial cells. And in the heterozygote condition, electroporated with the TBC1D3, although we do see an increase of the oblique divisions compared to the heterozygote electroporated with the control plasmid, we still have these, um, these, these, these horizontal cleavage planes or vertical divisions, which are very prominent in the heterozygote condition. So this perhaps could maybe explain why we can't produce basal radioglial-like cells in the mouse mutant because their spindle angles have already been changed dramatically and maybe this has uh, affected daughter cell fate. We also decided though to look at uh, an adhesion molecule, N-cadherin, which I've mentioned previously, in order to see what was adhesion-like in this LIS1 mouse mutant, especially when we'd electroporated with TBC1D3 
So first of all, I'm looking, I'm looking at the aherin, starting from the ventricular surface at the zero point and moving up into the up into the tissue. So you can generally see a peak of encoherin expression not far from the ventricular surface, and um, this uh, is um, this peak is shown both in the control wild type condition as well as in um, the the wild type condition um, electroporated with uh, TBC one D three. As well as that, um, when we analyze the, the heterozygote condition, and that's shown here by these darker bars, um, and this is uh, both the control condition as well as electroporated with TBC1D3, you can see that there are significant differences. In fact, we have a lower expression of n coherin in the LIS1 heterozygote, irregardless of whether TBC1D3 or the control vector are expressed. So adhesive mechanisms are very different in the LIS1 heterozygote uh, ventricular zone. And this was something which had been uh, greatly described previously. So this suggests that there's a role of LIS1 regulating adhesive contacts um, in these um, progenitor cells. And this is largely unexplored, in fact. So to wrap up what I've just told you for uh, the second approach where we were trying to assess ba basal radioglial cells to begin to assess them by using a mouse mutant to generate basal radioglial-like cells, we were able to show that we could not produce these in the LIS1 heterozygote mouse mutant brains. And as well, we were able to show that ap apical radioglial cells in the mutant, they have altered mitotic spindle orientations, as well as a reduced expression of n -cadherin. So perhaps one or other of these mechanisms, or both these mechanisms together, because they in fact can be interlinked, this can perhaps explain why you would not have uh, the generation of these basal radioglial-like cells in the mouse mutant. This is the mouse mutant situation, but it's important to mention as well, there have been some studies which have described a situation where the LIS1 gene is mutant, although it's not the only gene which is mutant in this case. This is related to um, uh, situations where the cells have mutations related to miller deka syndrome, which is a contiguous gene deletion on chromosome 17, which will delete LIS1 as well as adjacent genes. So organoids generated from patient cells um, which uh, were derived from patients with miller deacon syndrome, already showed in some cases, so by a study uh, performed by Yulia Ladovig's lab, that there were changed spindle orientations of apical radioglial cells in these organoid models. And there were also defects in n cadherin and also wind sync went signaling in the radioglial cells, the apical radioglial cells. A second study as well, um, published at the same time by Arnold Kriegstein's group, also looked at spindle orientations and showed that they were different in apical radioglial cells. But this study as well uh, kept the organoids in culture a longer time and also at radioglial cells. So basal radioglial cells in these human in vitro models, when you have mutations related to a contiguous deletion of chromosome 17, basal radioglial cells are produced, in fact, and nothing was mentioned in this paper about them being reduced in a smaller number, although quantifications were not shown. On the other hand, what was shown is that these basal radioglial cells, they do have ab an, an abnormal function. So they have um, a longer cell cycle, they have longer mitoses, and as well as that, they have an altered mitotic somal translocation. So there are some defects in basal radioglial cells beginning to be identified in these lysencephaly models. This differs from what we, we identified in the mass model, but there are many reasons why this could be different. But as well as that, I think some of these studies are beginning to show that LIS1, even in the heterozygote condition in the mouse, there is a phenotype, and this can be related to changed adhesion and changed spindle orientations. So to really globally summarize what I've been talking about today, I've been talking about these cortical malformations, which are recognized to be neuronal migration disorders, but I've been talking about some very particular uh, cases of heterotopia, which um, not only do we have perturbed neuronal migration, but this is actually most probably due to perturbed radioglial cells, radioglial cells which have their long processes going up to um, the peel surface, where you have this migration, um, uh, these migrating neurons attaching 
to these radial glial cell processes and migrating up to the cortical plate. If we have abnormalities in our radial glial cells, then this will perturb um, migration because the radial glial cell processes will not be identical. So we were interested in the heterotopia mass mutants as to why you had something resembling basal radial glial cells produced in abundance in the uh, mass brain. Um, as well as that, we were interested in a different situation in the LIS encephaly situation, in the heterozygote um, situation for LIS1, when you don't actually have in the neocortex and mutant brain, whether we could produce basal radial glial cells and study them further. So for EML1, we were able to show that the heterotopia seems to be related perhaps to these abnormal uh, centrioles and abnormal primary cilium uh, occurring in the apical end foot of the radial glial cells. And this could potentially either disrupt signaling or disrupt uh, different methods, um, even disrupting um, potentially adherence junctions to lead to the situation where you have basal radial glial cells, which can be produced from apical radial glial cells. We also identified, though, that spindles were longer and also cells have a different shape in uh, during in mitosis, but this could perhaps be downstream to these other signaling abnormalities. This is something which we're not too sure about, but um, we're hoping to, to show this. So we also have been able to discuss abnormal adhesion. Um, it, this occurs in both the EML1 and the LIS1 mouse mutants, in fact, and it seems that the adhesion of of these cells, either via their cell bodies or via their apical end feet, seems to be absolutely critical to keep these cells in the ventricular zone. And if you perturb adhesion or other mechanisms which will then subsequently perturb adhesion, then cells can leave the ventricular zone. So the ventricular zone, this is this fascinating and highly complex zone, and I think it should not be underestimated. There are many, many factors which can impact the cells in this region. And as I've mentioned, the cells are in different stages of the cell cycle. And so it's important to try and really systematically analyze many of these molecular, mechanical, architectural, and also temporal, temporal situations which could, can perturb the ventricular zone. Temporal, so for most of the work that I showed you today, we were analy analyzing a single stage, or at least I was showing you the data for that. Of course, it's important to analyze the situation in the ventricular zone throughout corticogenesis, because we know that this changes over time. So all of this needs to be taken into account, especially when we're interested in different mutant situations, which can perturb either intrinsic mechanisms, for instance, microtubules, or extrinsic mechanisms, uh, for instance, um, um, having signaling um, signals received via the primary cilium from the ventricular fluid, or via extracellular matrix molecules, which might be secreted by these and other cells. All of these can be perturbed in different mutant situations. And we're interested in continuing to analyze the ventricular zone with all of its um, very complex uh, factors and impact from a variety of different cell types. So this is all that I wanted to tell you about today. And so this is just my acknowledgement slide to acknowledge, of course, um, these very, very important people in our, my group, um, both uh, currently and formally, um, some of these people who I've mentioned today, and other people as well whose, whose work I didn't have time to mention. So a very, very great group working in this wonderful city of Paris, um, which looks approximately like this at the moment, if I've got my timing right. And also all of our very great collaborators, a number of these people I've mentioned throughout my talk today, helping us with the EML1 work, but also helping us uh, with um, the, the LIS1 work as well. And then um, in a new collaboration uh, with a variety of other groups where we're interested in single cell um, sequencing and generating uh, proteomics data from heterotopia situations versus wild type. So this in the future will generate both in mouse and in human models um, some probably very interesting data which we're beginning to receive already um, and which um, uh, is too preliminary to mention today. So thank you for your attention and I'm now happy to try and answer your questions. Okay, can you hear me? 
Thank you very much, Fiona, for the beautiful talk and very nice data, including unpublished work. It's really uh, nice to share this with us. So everyone is now welcome um, to ask any questions in the um, question uh, box. I'm going to read them. Um, just one thing. So unfortunately, Richard Smith, uh, due to technical issues, uh, couldn't um, present his work um, today. And so we have decided to postpone the flash talk of Richard Smith uh, to next week. So we will now just uh, go on with questions. And so again, please uh, ask your question in the box. So Fiona, I will um, read the, the questions in order. Okay, so the first question is from Isabel Cayet. Um, the question is, I saw that the Crickstein lab had shown that uh, planes of divisions were not associated to symmetrical asymmetrical divisions. Wrong? Yes, so of course, um, planes of division and symmetrical and asymmetrical divisions, uh, this is a highly complicated area. And one thing is completely sure that you can often have an asymmetrical division and still generate two progenitor cells. Yeah, and it's very critical. Um, we can't. We can only use spindle orientations as a guide, as a guide to maybe show that there are differences between mouse mutants and uh, wild type situations. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell us anything further about the daughter cell fates. So um, the only thing that we can do is combine those sorts of methods with other methods to try and identify what are the daughter cells that we're producing. And in each mouse mutant, which has abnormal spindle orientation you're probably as well uh, going to have different daughter cells produced each time. Nevertheless, there have been correlations, correlations made between having oblique divisions and generating basal radioglial cells. So this has been shown in a different uh, variety of models, including the ferret, in fact, as well as the, the, the primate situations, where this can be associated with having um, a production of basal radioglial cells, which can even occur during a certain stage of development um, in order to, uh, to know when these basal radioglial cells are produced. So I would agree with what you're saying. It's a highly complicated area. We can't use this very categorically. We can only be guided by the fact that this might be explaining something related to either our phenotype or the phenomenon that we wanted to analyze during cortical development. Okay, thank you. So the second question is from Noel Dwyer. Hi, beautiful talk. In the Ehrman one mutant and others with displaced pack six uh, progenitors, do we know for sure that the apical end feet are detached from apical membrane? Or is it possible that they are still attached but the nuclei are displaced basally? Thank you. So great question. And um, that's something which we, we, I didn't show the data today, but um, we've been looking at these basally localized PAC6 positive cells and looking at their morphologies and showing in fact that often you really do not have an apical process which extends below the nucleus. So therefore there is no apical process in those PAC6 positive cells. So therefore they would be um, more similar to the basal radioglial cells than to an apical radioglial cell which has just moved its nucleus up into the intermediate zone. So, um, of course, as well, we have this situation in the EML1 mutant, for which as well, we also now have a, a conditional knockout uh, for EML1, as well as the original echo mutant, where um, we've, been, we've been looking particularly at some of these PAC6 positive cells present in the intermediate zone, and already shown in the echo mutant, these cells clearly appear to be, in some cases, really an aberrant version of a basal radioglial cell. And in some cases as well, you can even see horizontally organized um, cells. So these would be PAC6 positive with long processes, but instead of that process still being attached to the basal surface, it would be detached and the cell would have organized itself tangentially or horizontally. So it's clear for us that even though we have some resemblance on the cells, they appear to be some pathological or aberrant version. Thank you. So the next 
A uh, question is from Anna Villalba. Hi Fiona, beautiful talk. Have you checked the attachment to the basal lamina in EML1 mittens to see if it is also disrupted? Okay, so this, um, this goes along with what I was just mentioning. A, a lot of the time, we will still have a basal um, attachment. Of course, this is really important to analyze this, and we know of some mutants where you can have very clear detachment from the apical surface, as well as a detachment from the basal surface. And this is very obvious. In our case, this is not obvious. It's not obvious that you do have basal detachment as well. Most of the time, you would most likely have apical detachment, but you would still have cells which are connected at the basal, the peel surface, in fact. It's only in, on, in some cases that it's possible to see that some cells have detached. And then just now, some of these can be horizontally oriented. So I would say that this mutant would be a situation where you often have cells which are basally attached, but you do have a proportion of cells which become basally detached. And so this basal detachment, of course, we don't know whether it occurs at the same time, but it is likely that it occurs secondarily to apical detachment, which is something which can occur. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Takashi. Is the role of LIS1 in basal RG production specific to TBC1D3 induced basal RG or common to basal RG stimulated by other genes? So that's an excellent question. And we've been also putting quite a bit of thought uh, into that in the lab. And so basically we decided to use TBC1D3. Um, this worked in our hands testing several different genes actually at the time to find try and find which would work the most easily. But I have to say that this was um, a project which we thought would be really interesting to, put, to generate lots of basal radial glial cells and test their function in different mouse mutants for cortical malformations. In reality, it was actually a lot more difficult to, to carry out this set of experiments. So we used tbc one d 3 and this gave us the result that I presented today, where we weren't able to see that there were any basal radial glial cells produced in our mouse mutant. But we decided as well that it would be really important to check other genes and try and produce basal radial glial cells by different methods because each of these genes are almost certainly impacting different pathways, in fact, in order to have this end point of producing basal radial glial cells. And so we, we decided that it would be really important to perform that experiment and that we can't conclude even in the mouse, actually, this one heterozygous situation, we can't yet conclude whether you can't produce basal radial glial cells because we need to uh, use different methods of producing them. So this is something which we really need to, to continue performing in the mouse. As I mentioned, though, uh, we've now become very interested in, in how, and this is, of course, the, the normal mechanisms, how LIS1 can actually impact um, adhesion. So this seems to be a, a novel niche, and we want to learn more about it. Okay. And the last question is from Adijoke Elizabeth Memudu. What is the correlation of encaterin with MDS? Yeah, so um, I, I sort of gave a lead into that by saying how we wanted to be interested in, in LIS1 um, and its role regulating NK adherin. Well, first of all, Milledica syndrome, um, as I mentioned, this is a contiguous gene deletion syndrome. And um, so LIS1 uh, is deleted as well as other genes as well. And so the, the observation by Yulia Ladevig's group is that NK adherin was also reduced in expression in the, the organoid model that they generated from the MDS uh, patient cells. And so adherin becomes reduced. And because of this, this will then perturb WIT signaling. And if they uh, performed rescue experiments where they reactivated WIT signaling, this then would take away some of the phenotypes in those organized models. So apart from that, I mean, apart from the relationship between LIS1 um, and Melodica syndrome, the NK adherin link would be related most probably to the function of LIS1. So LIS1, um, this is not widely mentioned, but LIS1, of course, regulates the dynein molecular motor 
and uh, the Daini molecular motor would be uh, important for the trafficking of LIS1, um, so, sorry, the trafficking of other proteins such as adhesion proteins to the apical end feet. So there is a possibility that when you have a mutation in LIS1, that this can impact the transport of adhesion molecules to the apical membrane, and this can then have an impact on those radial glial cells, so the apical or the lateral membrane, I should say. And so this could be a way that LIS1 can impact an adherin. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question, um, but that would be the link for me between NK adherin and LIS1. Okay, I think we have uh, all the questions. Uh, I'm just learning from the chat uh, box that it is your birthday today, Fiona. <laughs> and it I is. think you forgot to tell us about this, so I wish you a very happy birthday, and I guess uh, everyone is also wishing you a happy birthday. Well, it's been a very special day, so thank you. It's been um, very nice to be able to give this seminar, so thank you very much. Yes, I'll, um, I'll enjoy my birthday this no. evening. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Yona, and uh, thank you, thank, thank you everybody you. for attending the seminar, and see you next week. Thanks to all the audience, Bye. and thanks a lot, Stephanie, for hosting this today. Talk to you soon. Bye.